Hey everyone, it's Lisa Listen with Are You My Cousin and Jen Baldwin from Find My Past. We are here again. This is our fourth week on our summer road trip. So Jen and I, I my blog, Are You My Cousin, and I have partnered up with Find My Past. So we have been going on a summer road trip through the U.S. records at Find My Past. And we have found some really great gems in the Find My Past record. I know I've learned a lot, Jen. I really appreciate being able to <laughs> take this road trip with you um, one day. Hopefully it's a virtual road trip right now, but we hope to be able to take an actual road trip. That would be really the ultimate um, genealogical exper experience for us. But we want to welcome everyone today um, as we start to talk about our fourth and final stop on our U.S. road trip, which is Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I'm super excited. Yeah, I think this is going to be a good one. Um, and thanks, Lisa, for joining us on this road trip all summer long. It's been quite an adventure. I've learned a lot, too, actually. Some little hidden secrets, actually, in the Find My Past collection that I didn't even know about yet. So um, I will admit that on the last session. Um, and thanks to um, those of you who have been watching along with us the whole time. Um, and some of you are already chiming in and leaving comments. So thank you very much for that. I also want to acknowledge Liz on the Find My Past team. She is in the comments with us today. And she actually um, is kind of a superstar because she has not been feeling well the last couple of days, but she's with us anyway. Um, so thank you, Liz, for being a part of this and helping us out today. Um, William, hello. It's always good to see you. Deb, hi. Thanks for joining. Sylvia's with us. Uh, Rita is from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, right outside of Philly. Rita, I think there might be something in there. If you have any New Jersey research, there might be something today that surprises you, I hope. Uh, Janine is in Denver, but a native Philadelphian. And most of the genealogical research I do is either from Philly or Ireland. Yeah, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Lots of connections <laughs> between those two places. Uh, Dorothy's with us from, oh, oh, she doesn't say where she is, but she has ancestors in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and mm -hmm. Philadelphia before that. Um, Victoria's with us as well. You know, Lisa, um, of all the cities we've done, this is the mm -hmm. one place, actually, I do not have any family. I have family family from Pittsburgh in Philadelphia, but not, um, not Philly. I haven't found anybody in Philly. I know. Well, you know, it's funny because we t had talked about this earlier too. And of all the places we've got, I don't have anybody in, in Philadelphia either. Um, I was like, I, I was, I was, I have no, no connections, which really sort of surprises me quite frankly, based on just my general, you know, what my heritage is and, um, you know, maybe one day I'll find some, a collateral that kind of came down. But um, yep, I, mine's all Virginia. <laughs> yeah, at some point I'm I'm determined to find a Philly connection because I I actually, you know, the the history of the city itself and of course the colony and the state is so important. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, I would love any excuse to continue to study Philadelphia in, in the colonial period. So I'm hoping to find a colonial ancestor someday. Well, I think I will. In my story that I'll share in a little bit, I think I can give you an excuse for your ancestors in Philadelphia. <laughs> All right. Well, a few more people chiming in. Lisa's in Suffolk. Um, Kathy's down in Sydney. Thank you very much for joining us, Kathy. Yeah. Um, and good morning to you, Dorothy. Oh, she's in Atlanta now, not Philly. Uh -huh. So thank you, Dorothy. Um, Pam is in Ohio. No one from Philly, but thank you very much for joining us, Pam. And I like that because... You know, as we've just talked about before, Lisa, um, it's always good to go to a session that you don't really have anything active on your research because you're always going to learn something new that applies to your family history at some point. Absolutely. The strategies. It's, it's, you can take the strategies for one area and apply them to your location as well, just to get those creative research juices flowing. Yeah, absolutely. And we've already got a great comment from Rita, um, a little tidbit for it, which we didn't include actually in today's session. So if you're looking for marriage records, it was very common for young people from Philly to go across the Delaware River to Camden, New Jersey to get married. It was their Gretna Green. So if you have ancestors who got married in Philly, check Camden, New Jersey as well. Always learn something from the community. Rita, thank you very much. Thank you. That's, that's good to know. Good to know. Yeah. All right. Well, a whole bunch of people coming in today. Let me go ahead and put the slides up. How about that? Sure. Sounds great. And make sure I can see everything. All right. There we are. So yes, we are on our last stop, as you can see. Um, 
so yeah, let's let's move on through and yeah, I'm gonna get there eventually. Oh, Here I we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Philadelphia. We do a lot of our own tech around here, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and it shows. Um, and just quick, Jackie is with us, and she is watching from Ellis Island. Jackie oh, is Jackie. Um, uh, part of the Ellis Island team. Thank you very much for joining yeah. us, Jackie. That's exciting. So, yes, we are here. Oh, it's actually our fourth stop, not our third stop. Oh, it is? Oh, gosh. Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, no worries. So just to give you a little bit of background when it comes to researching Pennsylvania ancestors, those who are in um, Philadelphia, you know, a lot of times we as researchers do start with those vital records. We're starting with the birth, the marriage and the death records. And so when you're looking at birth and death records, the state level registration for those didn't start in Pennsylvania until 1906. But there are county records that are that county level records that they started earlier. There were some in the um, 1850s, like 1852 to 1854. So it was kind of a short time period. And then they picked up again, you know, around 1893. So there's some spotty ones out there. And I would encourage you, you know, to check that county level to see what might have been unique to the county you're researching there. And then, but they didn't start till they, to doing them, registering them at the state level to 1906. But here's the catch, guys the compliance for that was not really fully um, engaged until 1915. So just because your ancestor was born, say in 1907 or died in 1907, if, you, if, if there's not a certificate there, that doesn't mean you've missed it. It's perhaps that means that they weren't, you know, it just was out of compliance at that point. They hadn't incorporated at the county level to get those to the state. So check both state and county in, in those in those instances. And then of course the marriage, the marriage um, records are going to be at the county level. And those started um, September 30th in 1885 for statewide that, that they needed to be at, they will be at the county level, but they started doing those on a regular basis and the 1885 time period. So that should get you started on those um, and uh, records. And of course, check out the Gretna Green over in New Jersey. Was that Camden, New Jersey? She said I Camden. Yeah. Camden. If you're if you're missing something and not seeing you know, cross those state lines, cross those county lines as well, definitely. So, and here's my map for Jen. Yay, my map! <laughs> I'm loving this map. This one I got from the library. This is a, over at the house at the Library of Congress. And again, one thing that kind of I noticed with this one, we mentioned this in the Baltimore, is that when I pulled this map up, the thing that kind of got me. I love the you know between the bodies of water. I thought that how it just kind of is narrow right through there, but it also, there's that grid pattern again. Yeah. And for somebody who does a lot of research on the East, you know, the Eastern seaboard, particularly in the South, you know, we don't have those grids as we mentioned last time. We just don't see a lot of that as much. You might find small, tiny ones downtown, but this was, so this one really, I like that. That really kind of um, gave me an idea that, that tells me, you know, this was planned. They had a plan when they came in here for this. Yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. I, and, uh, you know, if you've been into Philadelphia, um, you can kind of even picture in your brain, I definitely have a very clear picture of what that, the center of that grid looks like, right. Um, mm -hmm. and the square there. So it's, um, you know, quite a, quite a place to visit if you have mm -hmm. not been quite a place. Yeah. I actually have never been to Philadelphia. Really? Um, unfortunately, I had planned to go, um, and, March of 2020. So eventually I'll get there. But um, I will tell you guys, it, it, if you read the Philadelphia post I have over on my website, Are You My Cousin? You will find um, at the bottom, I talk a lot about the places outside of the regular repositories that we go to, that we think of, to learn about the social history. And they're, they're, they have some fabulous walking tours, history tours, yeah. all kinds of museums there in Philadelphia that absolutely, you have to remember, these tell the stories of our ancestors and these are repositories in their own right. So when you go and you learn about the social history, you learn about what your ancestors are, you know, what it was like to live during that time period, what it was like to be a woman. Yeah. You know, that's the kind of stuff that really is going to one, make your research more interesting, but it's going to give you clues and it's going to help you learn where else to look for your ancestors. That's my soapbox, guys. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and um, while you were on your soapbox, um, 
Will, uh, Wendy told us actually that William Penn laid out the grid plan. I think I knew that, Wendy, but I didn't want to say it in case I got it wrong. So thanks for confirming that. Her ancestor lived on the corner of Race and Third. What a cool story um, to be able to actually pinpoint the exact location. Because can you imagine that, you know, historic photographs and maps and all of the context around downtown Philadelphia that must exist when you have such a precise location, you can really dig into the social history and the house history and everything else. That would be a lot of fun. That would be definitely, definitely. All Uh, right. Next slide. Next slide. Here we go. Okay, so this is usually one of us will give you a story that from our own personal research that we have as far as our towns. And as we said, we're not really, we didn't have anybody. So I found an ancestor, found an ancestor. Okay, I I am not related to Bridget Ward Clancy, but um, I went digging into the records. And specifically, I went into some of the newspaper records because I thought I really want to just see what I can, can find. And I love reading newspapers. And so... I came across a woman by the name of Bridget Clancy, and I learned quite a lot about her. You know, she was from, ba- I'm not going to say this correctly, Banneker, Kings County, Ireland. Um, I figured out that she had probably immigrated in about 1852. She settled in New Hartford, Connecticut. She had a sister in New Zealand. I actually even know the sister's last name. And I know that she was Catholic. And I have all of that and absolutely no connection to Philadelphia, right? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, Phil, Philly's nowhere in there, right? Okay, so flip to the next slide, if you will. And now re, the, I found that information in a newspaper over on Find My Past called the Catholic Standard. Now these are actually, this was out of Philadelphia. And so this was September, 1878. And this is an ad. Her sister, Mrs. M. Sherlock, down at the bottom, is looking for Bridget. She gives us a married name. She tells us what her maiden name was there. You can see she was a, um, where she lived in Ireland. We know that she came. This struck me. She came to America or went to America about 26 years ago. So 26 years later, in 1878, she's looking for her sister. I thought that that really struck me that, you know, here's a woman who who is still, you know, desperately looking for her sister to make some contact with. When she was last heard of, she was living in New Hartford. I know where, so I know where she was living with her aunt and uncle Cruz. Um, so she's looking for information on the address. Can you flip to the next slide for me? Sure. So what struck me here was this is out of the Philadelphia um, Catholic newspaper collection. It is the Catholic standard, but I have locations, I have surnames, I have family relationships, I have immigration information for somebody who didn't even live in the area. And I know that when you do immigrant research sometimes, and, and, and we've, I've done this before and looked in other places, you know, you, you go to the, the, the newspapers, you go to those newspapers and you're looking in those information wanted sections to see if, if they're looking for somebody, if they're looking for another relative who has come over previously to maybe hook up with them, maybe somebody's put, you know, trying to find out where they landed, all of that. They've lost touch. And this is where they would go. But they not only did it in the newspapers and in the and even Irish, you know, newspapers there in the in the cities, but in the religious newspapers as well. So my guess is I wouldn't be surprised if Mrs. Sherlock put this type of advertisement in a number of newspapers. And so I hope I don't know if she ever found her sister Bridget, but this really kind of gave me that idea of if I am if I had a Catholic ancestor that I'd lost track of anywhere in the US, I would actually go and check these the Catholic standard. I would check these Philly newspapers as well because it was such a large um, population and it was kind of the center for a lot of Catholic activity as well. So this was something I was just like, yes, I wanted to share that with you because again, it's a strategy that that you can use whether you have you know, a Philadelphia ancestor or not. Yep, that's right. If you're Catholic, yeah. you want to get into those records. That's right. And we're finding this. Um, so the Catholic Standard is the one uh, Catholic newspaper that we've published 
so far from the US. We do have a couple out of the UK as well on Find My Past. Um, and what we're finding actually is a lot of this, um, you know, a lot of these information wanted ads, a lot of the same pieces of information being published in paper after paper after paper, even more so than kind of regular standard papers or political papers. These niche, niche religious papers have really picked up on um, that duplication of information. And this kind of material, these information wanted ads are particularly particularly predominant um, in that kind of repetition. So if you don't have access to the New York Catholic uh, Diocese newspaper or the San Francisco newspaper or, you know, St. Augustine down in Florida, try Philadelphia, try England, try Ireland and see if you can't find some information um, because that Catholic thread is what keeps them all connected. Right. Yeah. Right. Really good point. I'm glad you use this as your story, Lisa, because it gave a, a great way to, to talk about that. And we'll actually, um, I'm going to actually show you the Catholic standard again in a few minutes as well. Um, and actually, let me just throw up a comment here because Joanne is saying, I found loads of info on my family uh, in the Catholic standard and other Catholic resources. So Joanne, I'm really happy that that has been working out for you. That's fantastic. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so let's get into a little bit of um, Philadelphia research in general, right? Let's let's talk about some of the historical points and some of the things that you kind of need to know when you're getting into Philly. Um, and I love this slide. I'm just going to stop and admire it for a minute. I think this is one of the favorite slides I've ever created, actually. Um, <laughs> um, there's a couple of things about Philly that we de definitely want to know. Um, the first and one of maybe the things that surprised me the most, actually, given all of the struggles and, and, and encounters and violence and wars and everything else, there's no courthouse disasters known in the Philadelphia area. Of all, like, you look at the, you know, the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, and you had no damage to the Philadelphia courthouse. That's kind of extraordinary, you guys. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so no known damage to the records then, which is a great thing, right? Of course. Um, and as we talked about last week, or last time we were on, um, the Draper Manuscript Collection is worth repeating. It's really a must-utilize resource for anybody in, Phil in the Pennsylvania area, the Trans-Allegheny West, uh, from that 1740 to 1830 time frame. Uh, and again, you can find microfilm of that collection at the Family History Library in Salt Lake City and a, a number of other major repositories around the country. Um, just about every state has a copy. The originals are at the Wisconsin uh, Historical Society um, and the Pickler Memorial library. The collection is actually split between those two institutions, um, but microfilms readily available. So if you have anybody in Pennsylvania um, in that time frame, especially towards the western edge of the state, you definitely want to look at the Draper Manuscript Collection. It's kind of a general must know about, about Pennsylvania yeah. research. But of course, Philadelphia itself has a couple of really unique advantages. Um, one of the first and foremost is that they have so many historical societies that are based there, right? It is kind of the heart of American history. Um, you know, when we think about those kind of early colonial periods all the way through modern day, Philadelphia is one of those cities that just plays a crucial role. So as a result, we have a lot of publications and a lot of resources available through those historical societies. So it's definitely worth putting on your list and really right at the top of your list. Uh, you want to make sure that you hit those organizations. Um, and of course, as kind of that crucial place um, in American history, um, newspapers around the world of all types, right? We talked about Catholic newspapers specifically, but all newspapers really carried news from Philadelphia really heavily, especially from kind of the American Revolution through the American Civil War. Once you get to the end of the American Civil War and kind of into the you know turn of the century towards closer to 1900, it slows down a bit. But that period from roughly 1775 to 1865, about 100 years there, there's a lot of news going all over the globe coming out of Philadelphia. So Again, if, if the newspaper you're interested in, you can't find if it's not online or you can't find a copy of a microfilm somewhere, um, check some of these other international papers, you know, check the New York Times, check London, check um, DC, right? All these mm -hmm. kind of major places that publish papers as well, because you're going to find materials out of Philadelphia from, um, you know, just about everywhere. Yeah. And then, of course, um, one of Lisa and I's favorite thing to talk about is just context, right? 
um, arguably the most famous American during the period of the American Revolution was Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he was known and kind of a celebrity, if you will, across most of Great Britain and, and Ireland, all the way through Europe, certainly in France. He served there as an ambassador, but he spent most of his adult life in Philadelphia. He's actually a native of Massachusetts. Um, but spent most of his adult life in Philadelphia. So if you read about Franklin, you read his biographies or his works or any kind of those historical academic works about Benjamin Franklin and his role during the revolution or his life as um, a public servant, you're gonna give context to your research about Philadelphia and the era that he was that he lived in uh, and the impact he had. So you're going to learn about Benjamin Franklin, who is an interesting subject in and of himself. And then you're going to learn mm -hmm. about the environment in which your ancestors lived. Oh, and that environment is so, so it's important. Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just love it. Um, okay. And we're going to go back to comments because I love this. Ben Franklin founded almost everything in Philadelphia, <laughs> the University of Pennsylvania, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the country's first fire department. He may have invented the cheesesteak. Um, so we have a lot to thank him for, actually. <laughs> thank you for that, Jeannie. That's great. Um, fabulous. Um, and one of my recent discoveries about Benjamin Franklin that I got sucked into really badly last week. Um, and I still actually technically haven't finished reading yet, but I can kind of can't wait. I found this um, published in the Scots Magazine. This is an interview that they did with, um, they actually did this interview in London with Dr. Benjamin Franklin from 1767. And guys, this is like seven or eight pages long of just mm -hmm. questions to him and and his answers kind of verbatim, right? So the first question they asked was, what was the temper of America towards Great Britain before the year 1763? And for me, you know, being a, a very quite passionate student of the American Revolution in that period, right? Reading some of these responses was, was just incredible, right? His answer was the best in the world. They submitted willingly to the government of the crown and paid in all their courts obedience to acts of parliament and on and on. He talks about fashions and commerce and um, natives of Britain were always treated with particular regard. And then they say, what is their temper now? And he says, oh, very much altered. Right? <laughs> I'm like, I just love this. I love this. So it's pieces like this that are really going to give you an idea of what it was like to be in the Philadelphia area or or even just in, in the colonies, um, right, leading up to the war, right? And so really, really cool um, finds and discoveries to be made. And I just kind of stumbled across this one by searching for, I probably just searched Benjamin Franklin and put in some years and this article came up and I, I'm like ready to print it out on nice paper and frame it and put it in my office. I just think it's really cool. <laughs> you know what I'll be doing when we get done here today. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oops, okay, hang on, I lost my screen. Two okay. seconds. Uh oh. Okay, here we go. We're back to normal. Okay, so um, with that note, I'll stop talking about Benjamin Franklin for a while. At least I'll try. Uh, <laughs> so when we go through our historical journey of of the Philadelphia area and Pennsylvania, of course, we go all the way back to the first um, arrival of of the white settlers in the Americans. Americas. Sorry, I said that wrong. Um, so from the earliest years, right, 1633 to 1655, those first 20 years or so, there's a lot of Dutch, Finnish, Swedish control over the area. Uh, in 1664, New Netherland, including what is now Southeast Pennsylvania, is surrendered to the English. Um, but another war breaks out. The Dutch kind of send this large armada to retake the area, but eventually it is ceded to England for the last time by 1674. So by that point, it's firmly in English hands. And then we know, of course, William Penn arrives in the 1680s. He founds his English colony, offering religious freedom, liberal government, and inexpensive land. And Quakers arrive and establish the city of Philadelphia. From there, we have a number of important um, factors that go into the the making of the social life of Philadelphia, right? We have a large period, about 50 years, where we have a, a heavy influence of Welsh, German, and Scots-Irish um, that are all immigrating into the area. We have a number of different religious denominations immigrating into the area. So when you think about Philadelphia in its colonial period, you really need to be thinking about a very diverse population. Um, 
And then, of course, there are disputes over land, as with just about every other colony. In the 1730s, we have Cressop's War, uh, which is essentially a border conflict between Pennsylvania and Maryland. It's finally settled when the Mason-Dixon line is established in 1767. So this conflict went on for 30 some odd years. Now, most of it happened kind of earlier, um, but they didn't really officially reach that settlement until 1767. So if you have ancestors in that time frame in that area around the Mason-Dixon line, you really need to be looking at this kind of historical context to understand where the records might be and how that might have impacted your ancestors' decisions. Um, of course, 1787, Pennsylvania is admitted to the Union, one of the first. In, um, from 1790 to 1800, it actually served as the capital of the United States. And then finally, we start to see some Western movement. Around 1811, steamboats begin that all-important travel from Pittsburgh down into New Orleans and other areas up and down the Mississippi uh, and the Ohio River. So you get kind of this really significant period of colonial history. And then there's the Revolutionary War kind of through that early federal government. And then a whole nother period of history to really study as we move in and out of the Civil War, uh, excuse me, the early 1800s, War of 1812, and into the, the American Civil War. Now, as a result of all of this movement and all of this important history, there's a number of different types of writing and styles of writing that are found in the manuscript and historical collections from the area. So one of our top suggestions for today is to actually work on your paleography skills, study that handwriting, because there are a number of different versions of early American handwriting, and it's important that you're able to read the original documents, at least be able to interpret them um, to a reasonable level. So practice those skills to be able to better make uh, use and take advantage of those original manuscripts. Definitely, definitely. And there are a lot of good resources out there um, that you can take advantage of online for practicing that. And um, I think I actually even have a post about reading old handwriting on my on my website as well. So there are lots of places to check, but nothing really replaces just practice. Just practice. Yeah, I would agree with that totally. Just find a random document somewhere. Um, you know, Find My Past has a number of early collections um, with different handwriting on them from kind of all over the British diaspora. Just grab one and try to transcribe it and, and mm -hmm. see how far you can get. Okay, and then we always want to cover the census information for each of the areas that we've talked about in our virtual tour. Um, Pennsylvania, of course, was the second state to ratify the Constitution, so they are included in all federal censuses, and they never actually took a state census. It's the first time that we have come across this in our tour. Um, <laughs> So we're going to make a, another recommendation today, and that is census substitutes instead. So although they never took a state census, there are a number of smaller censuses that were um, taken across Pennsylvania. So a few examples are on the screen. The 1671 census of Delaware, which, of course, at the time included residents of what is present day Newcastle County, Delaware, all the way down to Philadelphia. Um, we have a, the list of persons to the colony of New Amsel from 1637 to 1682 as a census substitute. The septennial census returns from 1779 to 1863. It sounds like a state census, but it's really taxpayers. They only enumerated taxpayers um, in order to determine representation in the General Assembly. So essentially only white Protestant males in most cases who own land. Um, and so you're not going to find everybody in those census returns. And then the tax list for the state of Pennsylvania is part of the United States Direct Tax of 1798. So a handful of examples to kind of get your imagination, get your creative juices thinking um, and flowing and find those census, go out and find those census substitutes for the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, Jen, I just want to point out, and I'm glad you mentioned the tax list and that as you, as, as you get, add those to your research kind of toolbox is really making sure you understand who is being taxed yeah. at that time period because it could be you know white males landowners but in some of the other taxes and i see this here in the south i, I honestly am not sh as sure about up in pennsylvania but there's some age limits like if somebody mm -hmm. once they hit a certain age and they age out of paying certain taxes so just because they're not there doesn't mean that they passed away it may mean they no longer are required so make sure you understand who was being taxed and the and the limitations that would be there. Yeah, absolutely. Understanding the context behind the reason the record was created in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Always. Always. Um, okay, so 
uh, as per always, we always talk about different archives. If we were actually visiting the state uh, in person instead of virtually, um, my the number one place on my list is always going to be the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. I've been there a couple of times now um, and have had the pleasure of doing some research there. And, and we have a partnership with them at Find My Past. That is one of the most spectacular archives I have ever seen. Um, they are absolutely wonderful. Their staff is generous with their time um, and incredibly knowledgeable. Their collection is outstanding. I really can't say enough good things about the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, who I will probably refer to as HSP moving forward today, because um, Historical Society of Pennsylvania is a mouthful. They are in Philadelphia, um, and there are a number of other facilities right around them. Of course, the city is full of great collections. The Lutheran Archive Center at Philly, for example, uh, the Carnegie Library, oh, excuse me, that's in Pittsburgh. Um, got ahead of myself. The Free Library of Philadelphia. Um, just if you are going to go into Pennsylvania for research, Philadelphia really has to be on your list. Um, even if you're researching up in you know, the Northwest County, I put Erie County Public Library on my map today because I have ancestors from who were in that area and I would really like to go to Erie County, but if I'm ever gonna go to Erie County, I'm gonna also make sure I get over to Philadelphia as well. Um, so tell us where you would like to go. Um, oh, and Christine says, um, this is a great comment, Christine. Thank you very much. Um, John, let me put it up on the screen here. HSP is great, but take a sweater. So cold, but great records. I completely agree. I agree. A hundred percent. Yep. Archives are almost always, libraries are almost always cold, but HSP I find particularly chilly. Yes. Um. <laughs> that's why I, That's why I take like a scarf or something, because if I get, you know, yes. it's hot or cold, I can always kind of make adjustments as I go. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I dress for archival research the same way I would dress for like camping or snowboarding or hiking. You know, I dress yeah. in layers and make sure I can take things off and add things back on. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So uh, a number of other really good facilities across the state, right? The Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania is fabulous. Um, I started to mention the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, also a really wonderful facility, and a number of others. So um, if you have suggestions to add to this list, places you think that people getting started in their Pennsylvania or Philadelphia research should go, by all means, share them in the comments. Let us know what you have found. Um, it, it's a fantastic state full of historical archives. So you really can't go wrong anywhere in Pennsylvania. Mm -mm. Okay, so with that, let's get into the collections on Find My Past. Now, I've once again chosen just a few of the um, materials that we have available uh, to our subscribers just to give you some examples. I'm going to talk quite a bit about the Historical Society of Pennsylvania collection. Again, I'm going to refer to it as HSP. Um, there's a lot there, you guys, and, and it's not not utilized as often as it should be, in my humble opinion. Um, I, you know, there is an incredible amount of information in that collection. So I'm hoping that um, today we'll get some of you excited to go research in the HSP collection. I'm also going to look at a couple of others. The ones that I'm not going to talk about that are on this list are the Archdiocese of Philadelphia Sacramento Registers. Now, the reason I'm not going to talk about those is because I'm going to talk about newspapers instead. Um, but the Sacramento Registers um, from Philadelphia are of, of course, absolutely crucial um, for telling not just that Roman Catholic story, but really the history of the Philadelphia area. So if you have Catholic history uh, kind of in Pennsylvania anywhere, make sure that you take a look at those. I'm also not going to refer to the Germans to America passenger list because, again, we've shared passenger lists before in this series. I want to talk about some of the things that are a little bit more unique to the area. Um, so let's start with HSP. Um, from the HSP collection, we have a number of different um, collections online on Find My Past. Births and baptisms, marriages, deaths and burials, all really, really important vital records. The vast majority of those are religious records. As we talked about at the beginning, uh, Lisa introduced us to the vital records and kind of official state vital record keeping um, for the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and of course, we know it started quite late. So those religious records are really important important. We're also, um, we also have quite a massive collection of congregational records. So the business of keeping a church um, uh, is included in there, and we're going to find our ancestors there quite a lot. I, I really want to tell you about the World War II casualty cards. Um, and then surprisingly, maybe the New Jersey Vital Records collection, which actually comes out of 
HSP, even though it's for New Jersey. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into some of these really great examples. The first, of course, is the baptism collection. Um, so the vast majority of these vital events are what's referred to as the greens and browns at HSP. And the reason they're called that is because the books were bound in green and brown covers. So if you walk into HSP, um, on the first floor, there's a whole little section um, of books that are manuscript collections that are green and brown. And so a number of years ago, Find My Past went in um, in partnership with HSP and we digitized those materials. And what's inside those books are transcriptions like this and sometimes original records, original copies, sometimes newspaper clippings, a whole wide variety of different types of sources where genealogists and society members from years gone by sat down and documented in these books all of these transcriptions from churches kind of around the state. So it's a really, really great collection. I will reiterate, they are not the original church records. They are copies. But in many cases, they're the only copy that, that continues to survive. Um, in many cases, the original church records have been lost to history or destruction. Um, and so we're really grateful that we have all of these society-driven, volunteer-driven records um, as part of this Greens and Browns collection. Uh, so the example that you're looking at on the screen is from 1712, and it's actually the baptism of a young man named William, William Pepper, who is the son of Will and Francis. And Debbie just asked me to speak a little slower, so I'll try, Debbie. Um, I get really excited when I talk about records, so I'll, I'll try to keep myself at pace. Um, so Will is the son of Will and Francis Pepper. And you may remember him or know about him from your history class. Um, Will Sr. was an American physician. He founded in partnership with, um, uh, I've just forgot, Benjamin Franklin, sorry, the Free Library of Pennsylvania. Gosh, that was horrible. Uh, and was a longtime provost of the University of Pennsylvania. And this is his son uh, and being baptized at two weeks old. In the deaths and burial sections, you again have a number of different types of records. So the example is from a Mennonite graveyard. These are transcriptions of headstones. Um, in this case, uh, they were covering part two, 1800s to 1980. So in some cases, you're getting actually quite recent for genealogical records. But in many other records, you're going all the way back to the very early 1600s. And of course, in those cases, um, we're looking at cemeteries and headstones that may no longer exist, may no longer be readable, um, may have worn down to the point where you can't tell what they say. So these transcriptions become incredibly important. Not a specific example on this page to talk about, but just a nice, clean, typed transcription from the Line Lexington Mennonite Graveyard. And then the marriages, uh, right? We have to talk about all three vital events. Again, just a really great example. This is from 1846, a transcription of church records. Now you'll notice that the page itself, if you look at the very top uh, header of the document, they actually have used an, a baptism register to document marriages. So they've crossed, crossed out the words baptism and date of birth and all of those things. And they've used the kind of basically what seems like an extra register sitting around um, to transcribe these marriage records. So when you're reading through these collections, when you're looking at these images, don't let things like that confuse you, right? Really rely on the metadata, the transcription, the index for the record, um, because all of that was created and given to us by the staff at HSP. Um, and they, they've gone through this collection kind of tooth and comb uh, fine. So um, really pay attention to what the transcription says in addition to what the image says in this case. A um, couple of um, notable entries down towards the bottom, entry number 28, you actually have a reference to someone in the United States Navy, um, a lieutenant um, there down towards the bottom and his bride. So keep in mind that all those little pieces of extra information are gonna be included in these transcriptions. They were very detailed when they um, took these copies. Okay, so now into one of my other really favorite collections, um, and this is the World War II casualty cards. So the, one of the reasons I like these is because of the, the depth of material that you can get, but the photographs are really outstanding. So let me tell you a little bit about why these records were created. So these were actually created by the United States Army 
and they um, at the start of World War II, and they were sent to local newspapers. Now they did this in just about every major city. Um, thankfully, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania saved one of the collections from one of the major newspapers. Um, it was donated as part of the manuscript collection. So what this is, is so whenever a soldier, excuse me, did something worthy, um, noteworthy, um, or um, unfortunately, if they were injured or if they were killed in action or taken prisoner, um, the newspaper would have their basic information and a photograph of them ready to go so that the army could just notify the newspaper and say, this gentleman, you know, was awarded a Purple Heart, for example, the newspaper would already have that information on file and they'd be able to publish the story right away rather than waiting for that back and forth of information. Hmm. So there's a number of different formats for these cards. Um, this example that you're looking at is actually quite detailed, right? It's kind of his headshot and all of his information in one place, which is really convenient. But we can see right away he's a private, Oliver Augustine. Um, we know the name of his wife. We know his address. We know his um, the in induction date into the army, his birth date, his age. We know the newspaper that this was sent to, the Philadelphia Record in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So there's a lot of information here. But again, these come in a number of different formats. So sometimes you're going to find just real basic information like this one, right? So this is Robert Arthur. He's a sergeant from Berlin, New Jersey. And remember, it wasn't just Philadelphia folks. This is anybody in the region that they thought the newspaper might print about. He was liberated from a prisoner of war camp. Um, we do see that he was in the Second World War. He was listed as a casualty um, and, and so forth. And his, his wife's name is Mary, right? So we even have a handwritten address kind of at the top of the card. Um, another example from um, Joseph Arve. Now, I and honestly, you guys, to find these examples, I really just scrolled to the next image because each one is a little bit different. Um, he was actually wounded uh, June 7th. He was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Joseph W. Link, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph W. Arve from Lincoln Highway. Um, he was killed in action in Italy in October of tw or October 26. Right. So. Um, a lot of information, again, slightly different than the first example, but just kind of shows you the types of information that the army would be communicating to the local press. Um, and then one more, a third example that's of this nature. He was also killed in, in action. He was killed at Iwo Jima, um, February 21st of 45. He's listed as a casualty. You've got his address and his wife, Edna, up there in the corner. So important information. And um, a collection that you're not really going to find anywhere else. Um, these individuals, of course, um, could have uh, been lost during the war, but also very much could have survived. Um, so here's one more format to share. It doesn't look like very much, right? We just have his name, his rank, and his location. But then we get this. Um, it's a little snippet. This was what was sent to the newspaper. It says that um, Salvatore was the son of Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Avellino of this address, right, 1629 South 13th Street, completed his training on a Liberator bomber at the Pueblo Army Air Base, which happens to be here in Colorado. He's a gunner on a combat crew and is expected to go overseas soon. He entered the service September 43. So this is the information that the newspaper likely would have printed. Um, and of course, in this case, we do get a picture as well. So here he is. So there's a number, again, a number of different formats to these cards, but well worth your time. Um, this is another one that is not necessarily kind of a killed in action or wounded situation. Um, it's commemorating his 50th combat mission um, um, uh, of this individual service in Italy. Uh, Second Lieutenant Warren R. Ock, he's 21 years old. Can you imagine being 21 and already having flown 50 missions? Um, it, he was a navigator on a B-24 Liberator. Um, and um, down at the bottom there, it says his golden mission was to Munich, Germany, the cradle of Hitlerism. Wow. Incredible, right? Um, and, you know, obviously these are coming from the Army PR kind of offices going into newspapers. So they're going to highlight, you know, those kind of splashy um, PR moments, right? So kind of a, a hidden collection, a little bit of World War II history that not a lot of people um, 
seem to be utilizing. So go out and find your World War II Philadelphia ancestor, please. <laughs> what a fascinating collection. And, and to have the, those with the photographs, what uh, an it's amazing. It's remarkable, right? It's not a place I would have thought to look for photographs. <laughs> but, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I've always wanted to kind of explore this idea of, you know, how many other cities have newspapers that retained these types of materials? Because if they did it in Philadelphia, they certainly did it around the country. Um, and does Canada have an equivalent? Does England have the equivalent, right? Like, you know, right. by the time we get into World War One, World War II, mass media is most definitely a thing. And so, um, you know, what other materials are out there sitting in newspaper archives that, you know, beyond just the news, the print newspaper? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so we did mention at the top that we were also going to talk about some New, New Jersey records. And the, again, the reason for this is because of the proximity for New Jersey into Philadelphia, the Philadelphia area. Um, and these are also held at uh, the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. So the New Jersey collection actually includes much more than vital records, um, baptisms, burials, cemetery inscriptions, funeral records, minute books, uh, miscellaneous records, town records, tax records, wills, probates all sorts of stuff are kind of shoved into this New Jersey collection. It's a really, really outstanding collection. And again, these are transcriptions from those lovely volunteers. Um, but if you look back, we really see that some of the history of the area is really covered, right? Um, this happens to include transcriptions from people who died in the year 1799. Uh, and there's a little asterisk. So there's more information down at the bottom of the page about those year notations. Um, really kind of interesting material. So if you're looking for research in the Philadelphia area, you know, definitely want to make sure that you're not just looking inside the state of Pennsylvania or the county that you're interested in. That may be your primary target, but it's important to expand your research because geography kept people from using the appropriate or the correct courthouse um, or the correct parish church. Um, so, you know, most definitely you want to expand um, in terms of your research to look at all of the neighboring communities. Definitely, definitely. Um, so another good example from this particular collection from New Jersey, this is a, an image of some town records. Um, and this one, this example is in from 1749. And this goes back to our comments about paleography, right, that we talked about at the beginning, Lisa, because the handwriting here and the ink that they used and the smudging on the page can be a little tricky to use. Um, what I liked about this is this one volume actually covers, I wanted to say it starts in the 1730s, and it goes right through the civil or through the American Revolution. Wow. So there's a approximately a two page spread or maybe a page and a half for every year. They had an annual meeting, they made their notes, and they wrote everything down and then they didn't write another thing until the next year. Hmm. So you go all the way through kind of 50 years of this town's history in, you know, 120 pages or so of this volume. It's pretty incredible um, to see that kind of history laid out. But you have things like who was assigned the constable, who was assigned the person who was going to um, help collect taxes for the poor. Those kinds of, of activities were all documented in town records. And you can find those through this HSP collection. And, and what a unique and wonderful way to be able to track them year by year. Absolutely. Because yeah. I know when I research uh, mostly here in the South, I mean, I, I go through the court records and, you know, it's a lot of pages between when somebody was appointed, you know, the overseer of the poor one year and reappointed the next year. There's a lot there. But to be yeah. able to recreate that year by year, if you've got an ancestor who who would have been appointed to something like that or would have been documented, that's that's an incredible um, piece of, of evidence for them. Yeah. And, you know, we're especially in this example in particular, we're talking about pre federal census, right? Pre right. United States. Um, so there was no census uh, attempted uh, that I'm aware of, at least for the colonies as a whole. Um, so, you know, the first U.S. census is in 1790, and this is telling you year by year from about 1730 all the way up to 1790. That's pretty awesome. I would love to find my ancestors in this year by year. <laughs> I think I'm jealous now. <laughs> I know, right? Like, again, I want a Philadelphia someone. <laughs> someone adopt me. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so how do you find all these records on Find My Past? So there's one way that's actually really, really easy. Um, if you go to the All Record Sets page on Find My Past and you just type in the box, I've got it circled up in the corner, Historical Society of, you will get each one of these collections that I've just walked you through, with the exception of the New Jersey collection. If you want the New Jersey stuff, just type in New Jersey and you'll see it pop up. But um, part of the way that we published these particular records was to include the name Historical Society of Pennsylvania in the title of the collection. And it just makes it that much easier to find the materials. So if you're interested in these specific examples, um, just go to the all record set and type in Historical Society of, and that's what will happen on the screen. You'll see those five record sets and you're off and running. Yeah, I actually use, this is the kind of a search function I use frequently, mm -hmm. probably more than when I'm researching um, the, you know, in those find my past records for US based, you know, ancestors or somebody who's done the travel, I go into those and use that search function. And it really, um, it, it, it's, I like it. It also helps me find things that I'm, you know, if I typed in Philadelphia it might help me find things I didn't know existed on Philadelphia yeah. or yeah. New Jersey, you know, I, it, it, I use this search function a lot and find it very helpful. Yeah. And I, you know, obviously I'm biased because I work for Find My Past, but <laughs> but the all record sets page is basically a daily function for me. Um, you know, I, I can't remember a day in the recent past where I haven't used this page. Mm -hmm. And and that's me knowing the site as well as I do and knowing our collections as well as I do. It's still the fastest way to get to whatever it is that I'm looking for. Um, you know, even if it's, you know, newspapers or, um, you know, the 1939 register, I, I go to all record sets, uh, even for those really big titles. Um, and it works. One of the things I like about it is because you can filter by location and year range and all that. So if you're looking to do uh, research in New York for the first time and you don't know what's available, but you know your ancestor was in New York around 1850, you can search for just New York um, mm -hmm. in that text box at the top, or you can put it in the location box. And then you can say, well, the win, I want 1830 to 1880. And only that. So you're not spending your time filtering through records from 1927, right? Because you know, they were there in 1850. So it really helps bring it, uh, your research to a more organized and, you know, kind of, I don't know, intentional path. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm like you, that's, that's, that's my go-to on yeah. my past. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so a couple of other um, record sets from out, from Pennsylvania or the Philadelphia area, not attached to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Um, a couple that we um, that I'm particularly fond of. So this um, record set, the Register of Mine Accidents, is just an index. There's no images attached. Um, this is courtesy, actually, of the Pennsylvania State Archives. But one of the reasons I like this is because number one, mining is obviously a really important industry in the region, um, and if your ancestor was in the area chances are good you probably have a minor in the family. But the other reason I like this particular uh, register is because it tells me that he's Irish, Ooh. right? There's ethnicity clues in these in this index. Um, so it tells you, you know, what mine they were working in, the accident cause. So this one is a, a fall of slate at the face of the room. The type of mine, this is a, a bituminous, I don't know how to pronounce that, coal mine. Um, you know, it's a non-fatal accident. He was inside the mine when it happened. He's 66 years old. All this great information. But then it also says he's married. He's a pick miner and he happens to be Irish. Um, so if you're looking for clues to your you know, kind of British and Irish ancestry, this is a great option um, if you happen to have a coal miner. Now, as someone who also appreciates researching the history of mining, uh, my special, one of my specialty areas is the gold rush periods of the Western United States. Um, knowing the name of the mine, the operator of the mine, um, and the type of mine is actually really, really important information if you're going to study his occupation as a miner. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot to be said for this particular register. And again, very simple, you know, index collection, uh, no images attached, but a whole lot of information on these pages. I also noticed that right under the ethnicity, it says that he's a citizen. Right. Yeah. So, so clues to naturalization type things. Yep. So he was either born here or he naturalized. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So a great set. Um, 
Another one that I want to point out for everybody is the Book of Deeds of Manumission of Slaves from 1774 to 1792. Now, this is specific to Kent County. Um, and this is actually, there's an interesting story behind this register. So uh, the original register is actually now housed at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Uh, it's where it comes from. Um, and it's been microfilmed. And it's available online in a couple of academic resources. To my knowledge, it's never been indexed before. So Find My Past indexed this uh, manuscript. Um, specifically for publication so that you could search by name. Um, deeds of manumissions of slaves were, in fact, someone who owned slaves, who was an enslaver, and they would leave a deed of manumission saying, generally saying that after I die, um, freedom will be granted to these individuals based on this deed. So it was an official uh, document that was filed with the county. So at some point, this register would have probably been held with at Kent County. Um, and it somehow made its way into the hands of the local Quaker congregation. And it was held as part of the Quaker records, as a religious record um, for a number of years. And then eventually that entire collection was donated to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And that's where it lives today. Um, so it, it's for, again, as far as I know, it's the only version of this text that's available that's name indexed, although the text is available in other places, but a, a, a very important um, piece of Kent County history for those of us uh, researching our African-American ancestors. Um, okay, and then we move into those promised um, Roman Catholic Archdiocese newspapers um, for Philadelphia. We talked about these a little bit at the beginning. Um, there are actually three titles formally available in Find My Past. The Catholic Standard, which was re later renamed to the Catholic Standard in Times, and the coverage runs from 1866 to 1951. Uh, and then the universe, the Catholic, Catholic Herald and Visitor, which runs from 1833 to 1867. Um, so a little bit of overlap, only about a year or two. Um, but generally speaking, we have the Diocesan newspaper from 1833 to 1951 available on Fund My Past. And like Lisa was saying at the beginning, these are full of really, really Im valuable information. I pulled just a front page from 1917. Um, and you see all sorts of headlines, right? We've got information about World War I. Um, we have um, a story down towards the middle, Generosity of Irish, Delight's Holy Father. Um, we have His Holiness feelings deeply stirred because of um, Atheist Republic acts in Mexico. Um, cable flashes from Rome, National War Council committees, um, the Knights of... Um, the KFC patriotism highly commended Knights of Columbus. Uh, that took me a second. Um, but that, that last article off to the right is referring to the Knights of Columbus. And then later on in the story, also the YMCA. Um, all of these stories can be found on issue after issue after issue of these Catholic papers. And as you get into the pages and the depths of these, these newspapers, you really start to find some of those more personal stories as well. So the, the, um, information wanted ads, but you also get things like obituaries for members mm -hmm. of the faith. So if you have an ancestor who um, joined the, the clergy, right, um, served as a priest or maybe as a nun, you're going to get information about their travels, their assignments through the church. Um, you're going to get obituaries and stories around um, their life. So if you have someone who actually entered the church officially, um, you're going to definitely want to look at these Catholic newspapers as well. Yeah. Okay, and then, let's see, um, I've lost track of what time it is completely, so I'm just <laughs> talking now. Hopefully you guys can hang on. Um, a few yeah. hidden gems to, to, to cover. Um, let's, let's go through these a little bit quickly. Now, we've talked about a lot of hidden gems on Find My Past over the last few weeks. Hopefully my message has gotten across that there's a lot of information about our North American ancestors hidden in kind of British and Irish and Scottish and Welsh records. Mm -hmm. um, the London Gazette is one of my favorites. I've actually held this intentionally to the end. It's kind oh, of, you know, you have to see, watch the whole series to get the, the last little bit. Um, um, it starts quite early. I didn't write down the uh, first year for the London Gazette, but it essentially reports on the British viewpoint of the American Revolution and American history. Um, 
all the way through uh, that conflict. And then as you start to get into the period of the American Civil War and other kind of national American issues or Canadian issues, you really start to see a different perspective of that history. So the example on the screen is from 1778. And they're reporting out of Philadelphia, a letter from Sir William Howe uh, to Lord George Germain, who was um, essentially Secretary of State and kind of Commissioner of War during the period. Um, and then you get little snippets like this, right? Who's from, this is from 1861. Um, and it's a communication, uh, essentially a report back to um, the UK um, from individuals, both of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, you know, and they're reporting back on an invention actually that they've been working on together. So um, they filed this invention and it's a kind of an international uh international design because there's individuals in Glasgow and Philadelphia working on this piece. Interesting. So the London Gazette, um, all the way up to modern day, um, full of lovely, lovely little wonderful snippets um, all over the place. I would caution you though, if you search by keyword uh, for something like Philadelphia in the more modern issues, you're going to get Philadelphia Street, and Philadelphia Avenue in the UK uh, versus news about Philadelphia. And you'll see that a lot, right? There's you know, there's Baltimore, uh, Maryland, and there's Baltimore and other places. There's, you know, obviously New York and York. So some of that duplication starts to happen um, when you do those kind of generic searches. Good to know. Good to know. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, a couple other titles. So Scots Irish in North America. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks a little fuzzy, doesn't it? I'm sorry about that. Um, but it is a historical organization, the Pennsylvania Scotch Irish Society. So wouldn't it be great if you could find your ancestor listed as a member? Because doesn't that give you a really big clue as to where he might be from? <laughs> you, right. you know, this means writing that damn. Like, okay, yeah, I'm <laughs> <laughs> like, um, so this particular publication lists, of course, national officers, um, and in some cases, it lists address of members. So in that first column, you see examples from kind of all over Philadelphia. But in the second example, off to the right, you see lists of officers and members of state society. So you've got all across Pennsylvania, but you've also got wherever they had chapters elsewhere in the country. So down towards the bottom, there's an entry there from Indiana. Um, and they have examples of that from kind of all over the country. So certainly not specific to Pennsylvania necessarily, but, um, uh, you know, they had uh, organizations kind of all over the states. That's, that's an excellent that's resource. A, it's a good clue. <laughs> Everybody loves a good clue. Um, and then we move into one of our favorite Irish collections, the Donegal Workhouse Registers and Minute Books. Um, and again, don't let the title of this fool you. It's actually more of a national Irish collection than it is specific to Donegal. But in the middle of these pages, you find all sorts of information. This is a list of people who were given money to immigrate out of Ireland. Um, so allocations for passengers to leave Ireland and sail overseas from 1883. Um, and of course, we see several North American destinations on that list, right? There's Quebec, Philadelphia, Wilmington, uh, which would have been Delaware, New York, and so forth. So um, another great resource um, that's available, especially if you're looking for those Irish Americans. And then lastly, um, for today, the Scottish Vital Records. Uh, we could not let today go by without talking about it. We just released this a couple of weeks ago. Um, over 10 million new baptism, burial, and marriage records from Scotland. Um, and what you're looking at on the screen is actually the baptism of Andrew Carnegie. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, we find my past since now home to the largest collection of Scottish vital records. So if you're looking for anything Scotland, you've got to stop at find my past and give the records a try. Absolutely. And if you've done it before, go back and do go it. Go back and do it again because there's, there's a whole so lot more now. Yeah, there's a whole lot more. <laughs> whole lot more. Um, okay. So as always, you can reach Find My Past um, most easily at support at findmypast.com. Um, we're always happy to take your questions, your queries, whatever you've got for us, um, or reach out to us on social media. And Lisa always has resources for us as well. Yes. So you can find me. My blog is Are You My Cousin? You can find me at lisalisten.com and then backslash Philadelphia will get you to the Philadelphia post. Um, and you can check out the others there too. Yeah. Fabulous. All right. We, we, didn't, we didn't calculate how many miles we traveled, did we? Oh, uh, we should. I'm going to have to do that on the back end and come up with yeah, that. <laughs> we definitely have to do that. That's for sure. Um, 
All right, cool. So I haven't been able to watch the comments, but Liz has been paying attention for us. So um, thank you very much again, Liz, for sharing all those links and keeping on yes. top of us for us. So I know there was a lot of conversation about New Jersey and the counties around the Philadelphia area. Um, so there's lots of good information in the comments if you're looking for um, geographical information for that region. So thank you all very much for sharing those as well. Definitely. Yes, um, thank you. Do, do, do. I did try to speak slower. I hope I managed to do that. Um, I'm not sure I did, but <laughs> we get so ex we get so excited. <laughs> it's really hard not to, yeah. Even exactly. when it's not, as you know, even when it's not our ancestors, we get like really excited. It's just it. history, right? We all love, history, yeah. yeah, we all love it. Uh, okay, so I don't think I'm seeing any questions. Um, do, do, do. Oh, there is one. Hang on, let me put this on the screen. Let me see if we can address this really quickly. It's a big one, yeah. Robina. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, the only information I've been given on my great aunt is Census Township, Pittsburgh, Ward 22, etc., with a full citation. Um, Pennsylvania, family 112, date 910. Ebenezer Mitchell, age 37, wife Margaret, and a daughter Anne. Where best to search for more information on the family? Um, so it sounds like, Rubina, you've got a basic federal census in front of you. Um, I would start by trying to go forward and backwards, go to the 1900 mm -hmm. census, go to the 1920, 1930, 1940, um, move around the family. Um, these individuals are relatively young. Um, Ebenezer's 37, so I would start moving forward and try to collect all of those censuses. Um, you're gonna get a lot of clues on those census records. So you might get things like if they naturalized or if they were a natural born citizen, um, you're gonna get, if you get all the way up to the 1940 census, for example, you'll get where they lived in 1935 um, and so forth. So once you get kind of that backbone, if you will, of your research of this family, um, then you can start to kind of pour in some additional details from religious records, vital records, uh, civil registration, and so forth. Yep. That would be exactly what I would recommend as well. Yeah. Go to the census, federal census, and they're available just about everywhere. So um, every major genealogy website, uh, the National Archives has them, and just about everybody offers them for free. So you shouldn't be able to, shouldn't have any difficulties finding those federal censuses. Yes. Okay. Fantastic. Lisa, I think, um, I think that wraps us up for the day. I think we did it. I yeah. think we did it. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so keep on digging into this um, Philadelphia Philadelphia ancestors um, and just watch, you know, social media, both on, on the find my past Facebook page, my Facebook page as well. And um, you'll see other tips and tricks popping up throughout the next couple of weeks. So we'd love to, and love to hear your experiences as well. Absolutely. Uh, and if you make some great discoveries, send them our way. We'd love to hear your stories as well. Um, so you can send those to Lisa or you can send them to find my past. We'd be happy to talk about those and share those um, as we move forward. So it's been a great summer road trip. I hope everybody has enjoyed it. Uh, Debbie just was asking, where are our past talks? Oh. Um, this is the first one she's seen. I know they are living on the Find My Past um, web, uh, Facebook page. I think, they're, I think they're showing up on mine still as well. And um, I will actually have them in the post. I'm going to put them in the post as well that I've written. So great. They're also um, on the Find My Past YouTube channel. Yes. So, and, and I'll, I'll link to that out as well. So yeah. And a number of others. So um, both Lisa and find my past do pretty consistent um, live streams on Facebook mm -hmm. and other channels. So um, there's a lot there to go through. So um, not yeah. just the two of us <laughs> together, but, um, but lots and lots and lots of videos uh, you could watch if you want to spend some time. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jen. Thanks so much for having me and, and for the partnership of doing this. And um, I look forward to the next couple of weeks as we hear what people are finding. Yeah, sounds good. Um, and thank you, Lisa. It's been a lot of fun and a great pleasure. Hope everybody's learned something and I hope everybody's ready to go explore some new records. So get out there and, and do some research and have a good time. And um, we'll talk to you the next time we're online. Let's check That's both good. Find My Past and Lisa Leeson's channels for schedules for upcoming talks because we, like I said, we do stuff regularly. So yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Great. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.